Sally's show. This is, no, it's not. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Bob Sally's show. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. So um, it's uh, there's a lot of different variations of a writer and an artist collaborating on things. Uh, there's uh, in my history of being in comics, there are times where you find an artist and they stick. To, they, they just want the script and they stick to the script and they are paid, you know, uh, page rate and. That is what they do. They just bang, 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 and they're gone. Um, Sean, one of the great things about working with Sean <clears throat> is that Sean not only is an amazing artist, he's also a very talented writer as well. So um, the opportunity to work with somebody like that, I don't want to bottle him up, and I don't want to be handcuff him to only what I've written. I want to have him collaborate. I want him to have his own um, you know, creativity that added to it. Uh, so it was really an awesome experience. One, working with Travis as the editor. It was my first time ever working with an editor, which after that, it was like, I don't ever want to work on something without an editor again, because you really get, you really understand that you can get blinded by what you want and what your vision is, and you're not seeing what the other possibilities that you can go in different directions or even like taking something where you're like, I have the hero is this and the villain is this, and then somebody being like, yeah, but it would really be cool if you change them and you made them opposite. And so just turning things on your head is really what Travis did with that, uh, with Ogre. Uh, and like for like a second, I was like, no. And then I was like, yeah, okay. Um, and it was, it was great. And uh, it was, um, it made it like a whole fresh thing. Uh, it was taking something that was stale and making it fresh and making it something new and that's something that's never been done before. And at the time, I think what I was developing really wouldn't have fit Sean's art. And when we changed it and we did, made the changes to it, it ended up really fitting Sean's art. So, well, and we, I think it's important to note that we developed this, we developed the concept specifically for yeah. Sean. Yes. Right? Because Sean had done it. I yeah. Know that. Well, yeah, because we were, I mean, I, you and I wanted to work on something, but I didn't have anything that really fit that. And then I we think we've been talking about <coughs> territory. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we were. Yeah. And so Bob had this fairly straightforward fantasy thing, right? And uh, we wanted to do something with you. And then, but after reading Terraquil, uh, which is another book completely done by Sean, also published by us that you should get because it's amazing, we decided uh, that we needed something weirder yes. and a little bit quirkier to fit. You know what you bring to the table. So right. that that whole concept was developed like with you in mind. Yeah. Cool. You know, like the whole idea of like the corpse and the carrying head and the ghost and like none of that was in the no like, that, initial, that was never in the original. Such a big yeah. part. Oh god. Yeah. The, yeah. It, be, it became like the main trope, but it was never uh, that wasn't not part of the original pitch or any of that. Like yeah. we we really like we're like okay, if Sean's gonna do this, we have to make this has to get a lot more interesting and a lot stranger, and we have to like. Crank the dark whimsy up sure, to eleven. Sure. Well, it's important to be able to write to the artist's strengths. Uh, so it yes. sounds like that's something that you had in mind. When you Absolutely, were yeah. Developing, yeah. And again, I mean, like as a writer, when you have an idea, like uh, Travis and I talk on, on occasion, and I will start pitching him ideas, and he'll say hard pass. Most of the time, he'll say hard pass. But then every once in a while, you hit with a month, and he'll be like, and then there's nothing, and I'm like, all right, maybe I got him. Um, and he's like, no, oh, I was just going to the bathroom. Hard pass. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but, uh, you know, and then you, you do, you come up, but I think the more and more you try to keep grinding an idea out and trying to think of it something, uh, you, you end up having to really start thinking outside the box because you're like, I don't want to hear a hard pass again. Um, and, and then you, like, then with that collaboration with the editor, you start changing things around, you start making things better. And uh, what I've found, like, going from self-publishing and really being a one-man show uh, with the writing, and going right to script and to an artist and paying them, and they do exactly what they you said. Uh, bringing more people onto a team, like bringing the editor onto a team, uh, co-writing with somebody, having an artist that uh, does know something about writing, is uh, it makes the story so much better. Sean and I were talking last night about ogres and how we were going to, because we made certain changes, that the ending that we had might not work anymore. And we were sitting at the bar, and I think we were like getting really excited about what we're gonna do. And we were like, let's not tell Travis about this. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it is like where like if you're working with somebody who as a writer who's just collecting a paycheck, then they're just like, yeah, man, whatever you want, whatever you want to do. But having somebody that cares about the characters and cares about the script and actually knows something about writing 
you know, you can, you can really make it a better story. And everybody's collaborating on it and bringing out all of their, um, all of their ideas. Like speaking of co-writing something with somebody, uh, here is Dr. Christina Blanche. And um, you know, that she and I are actually going to be co-writing something. And because of working with Sean and because of working with Travis, I now, um, I want to bring other writers in that I respect and other editors that I feel like can, you know, enhance the story. So let's give, let's give you a minute. You probably ran. I did. <laughs> I ran so far away. Um, Fox Eagles. Did, did, we, did we wish a happy birthday? We did. Okay. We did. Just making sure. Got to cover that. Hi, I'm Christina Blanche. And, um, and uh, I am, like I said, I'm co-writing. He asked me to co-write with him, and it's awesome. Um, I was like, me? Are you sure, sure get the right, right number? So, um, so go on, and then. So yeah, we were just talking about how about. Uh, we were just talking about how you know the writer artist relationship. But since we have Travis here, I think that it's important to talk about um, you know the importance of an editor. I think a lot of people when they're starting to write comics, they don't think that they either don't think that they need an editor uh, or they just haven't experienced working with an editor and to see the benefits of it uh, but you know we always at source point press now it's like we are very much like you should always have an editor you should always find somebody to edit your book and again because when you're writing a book you have your blinders on and you don't see maybe the mistakes that you're making uh, and not just a uh, not I just think, a, I think a better word is the opportunities you're missing Yes, that's a good yes. That's an opportunity. Yeah, and also so. with, with comics, it's not just the words that you have to edit. You have to make sure that those words go yeah, comic next editing. level in the panel, and you're not saying, I'm going to open this door while somebody's opening a door. You don't, you know. Yeah, comic editing is a lot more intense than, than it sounds. It's not just like reading through a script and changing. It's, it's a lot, it encompasses a lot of things. Um, so for me, I don't, I don't know how many people here are familiar with SourcePoint, um, but we're, we've from the time I started to where I was actively editing a lot of books to now where I'm only actively editing, I think, three of our 10 monthly books. Um, and even that is probably gonna cut back just from a matter of like bandwidth and time. So we're bringing in a lot more editors, project managers as time goes on. But I look at my role um, as, uh, you know, I want to, I, I think you can tell when I'm excited about an idea oh, because yeah. I'll immediately just like change every single thing you just told me <laughs> and spit it back out at you like, well, what if you did it this way? Yeah. Right. And maybe it's the best thing. Maybe it's not. But my goal is always to try to make the person who's writing or pitching you the thing think about th think about their idea in a completely different way from how they're thinking about it now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that <clears throat> they're finding the most interesting story to tell within the confines of what they've created, right? So that, that's the, my first step, is to take whatever it is you're giving me and spit it back at you by shifting everything around about it. Or make, make like, well, what about this massive, complete, total change? Um, and then and kind of seeing where that lands, you know, or like how, they react, how a writer reacts to it, or whether there's a massive amount of pushback, or whether they have a bunch of reasons, or this, that, um, but my goal is to just try to make a writer think about am I telling the best possible story in this world, that in the, the confines of this fictional world I've created. Um, and then after that, I, you know, I try not to stand in creator's way, um, you know, or anything like that. I mean, I, I would say that I'm, I edit much more actively on the front end, and I get less and less involved as the project starts to reach fruition, right? Yeah. As it gets closer, I'll start passing stuff off to you know our production designers and things like that. And then by the time it's getting lettered, you know I'm not combing through pages and correcting lettering changes. Right? Somebody else is doing. That. Yeah. So for me, it's it's more about like let's massage this so that it can be the best possible thing that it can be, the most interesting possible version of what you're trying to get out. Um, and for the most part, I feel like I, you know through the course of my career editing, I feel like I've been fairly successful at that. Um, at the same time, as I'm sort of transitioning away from doing it more often, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm gonna miss it, because it's also like, can be like pulling teeth sometimes. Well, depending on who you're working with. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, for instance. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
No, it can be it can be hard. Like creators fall in love with what they have, and it's not even like that old trope of like, oh, you gotta you gotta kill your babies, yeah. you know, and writing. It's like, you know, someone's put together a pitch for you, and they're they're coming to you, and they're, in a way, they're asking you for money, right? You know, which, is, which is hard anyway. You're already facing an uphill battle, and you're coming back at them, being like, but what if everything you just told me is not the best idea? What if this thing that I'm telling you is the best idea? Which really should be taken as like, oh, this is really positive because if you put any thought into this at all, you must be interested. Yes. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes that is not the first reaction you get. The first reaction you get is like this, but, 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 you know. You and never then, got that with me. Yeah, at first, I'm very definitely. I'm like a sponge. Everything you say, just take it in. Like, after, you say? after the first sales numbers came in, then he was like, oh, oh, I'll try, I'll try this next I'll listen to what you have to say. <laughs> you know, before then, it was impossible. No, it's true. I mean, like I have a, I, I created my own comic book, um, independent comic book, Salvagers, and I love it. It's my baby, but I often look at it and I think, if I would have done this with an editor, or whether I've done it with you, or even like somebody that would have, we could have sat down, like it could have been much, much better. Um, and I think you know, it's still being a thing that we can move forward with. It can still be a, you know, a, a growing thing that gets better, but. Uh, Having something that I worked on that I did not use an editor, and now having things that I work on that I do have an editor, you can really see the difference in quality, and in quality in the characters and the story, and then, uh, and not to shift away from the, the writer and artist. Uh, no, no, the uh, editing is so important. It's, you can't undermine it. <clears throat> yeah. Huge part of the process. Probably the most important. Yeah, yeah probably. Travis <laughs> is the most important person the most, here. Just remember, write that down. The most important part is the editor. Well, and it, so uh, when, when I, I had my book and, and you graciously published it, I, I didn't really have that the editor relationship because I would write it and send it and they'd go, okay. And then it would go to Chi, the, the artist, and then that, that was it. So I guess. Josh well, your stuff is so good, <laughs> just coming in off the presses. Don't have my boots on. But there just wasn't that much to go. No, but I'm really looking forward to when, when with Bob having you know really getting to work with an editor. So I just you know I love bouncing the ideas and I well, was that like, particular so that particular project I've I've been I've beat on a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> It's all about asking questions, because you have to remember that we're dealing mostly with creator-owned books, which I imagine is probably a big thing that a lot of you here are interested in doing. So, you know, it's not like I'm editing Spider-Man, where I have a style guide and a, a corporate overlord telling you, like, these are the constraints with which you're telling the story. This isn't owned by me. It's owned by Bob, you know, or owned by Christina, or, you know, owned by Sean. This is their stuff. And so, I have to, you know, you, you are wielding influence very delicately. You know, you're just you're trying to not tell people what to do. You're trying to ask questions so they do it themselves, right? So that's kind of that's sort of the role, you know. And it's very different from like a, you know, when I talk to people who work for Marvel or, or DC, like when I, when I think of like editing a project and when they think of editing a project, they're very different things. I look at it as less less control and more like let's like work this to get to the best possible version of what you're trying to get to. Yeah. You know, as opposed to like, these are the constraints within which we can tell this story. And also, I suppose sometimes it's like these are the economic constraints within which well, we can tell this story. Yeah. Like this is too goddamn long. It's got to be short. Yeah, and that's kind of the thing we did with uh, with Ogre. It was like three issues, and then it was like, okay, the first issue is twenty four, and then I'm like, is it okay if I make the next issue twenty eight? And he's like, yeah, okay. And I'm like, the third issue, I'm like, thirty two pages. I'm like, all right, we'll make it fit. Yeah, we made it. We made it fit. Your profit margin goes down. Yeah, yeah. So, I have a question um, for you, you two. So, um, had you worked together before Ogre? No. So, how much did it change working together? as you giving you know the panel descriptions, not knowing, you know, you you know it's your style, but you don't know how you do things in your head. Right. So, were you like very detailed at the beginning, and then once you get back pages and you're like, oh, okay, then you get less and less. I wouldn't say that I was extremely detailed because I think when I was, when I was writing Salvagers, I was writing like one page was like three pages long. Uh, and then the artist that I was working with gave me a, um, 
he gave me a podcast clip that was uh, Batman, on, Fat Man on Batman with Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, where they talked about the first time that they worked together and how they, you know, Capullo was like, I'm not going to work with this guy. And Scott Snyder was like, I'm not working with this guy. And he was like, you know, he got a script and he was like, for 24 pages, it was 50 pages long. And he's like, and I immediately just threw it away. Uh, so I got it. I was like, you know, you, you, wanna, you don't want to give so much detail to your artist. You want to give your artist like some room to play and you want them to have a little bit of creativity too. So I think by the time that Sean and I were working together and also reading Tarek Will and knowing that Sean, you know, knew how to, you know, he was a writer and an artist, I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to be like that. Uh, and then the thing, that, I think the first thing that Sean and I did when we did issue one of uh, Ogre was he gave me back page layouts and there was notes. So everything that he did differently, on any page that he did anything differently, there was notes at the bottom of why he did it differently. And, and, and it was more of a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, but all of his suggestions, he like put it out there in a way where it was like, this makes sense. Um, and you know, and I would always go back to Travis and say, look, Sean wants to make these changes. And Travis I was like, yep. Sean's a genius. He said, exactly. That's actually exactly what he said. Sean's a genius, look, whatever. Well, your, your scripts <laughs> initially, they were not too detailed, but they were just detailed enough that gave me a great idea of what I needed to know just to get the, the bare bones down. Yes. And then as our relationship grew, and you know, we started trusting each other more with the story and the artwork. Some of the page descriptions in the script would just be do what you want. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would write it. There would be times where I would write page, it's your page, have fun. Like, right. And, or I might be like, at the end of this page, I need this to happen. Right. Um, and then, you know, and that was great. And I loved doing it. And I talking to Sean, he was like, I love those pages. Yeah, that's kind of one of my favorite ways to work. <laughs> when you see that red, yeah. see where it's like, your page. I always put it in red so he knows, like, oh, red, that's mine. Yeah, then I can just. Go to town. Go to town. So um, now we're working on ogres, and we are economically and for other reasons we're really trying to get this thing done, um, you know, within the calendar year. And we, uh, there, Sean's working on a lot of more projects now. So with the trust level that we're at now, um, you know, and I think even with you, uh, you basically, you know, Travis, the editor, he went over and I gave him the pitch of what I wanted the story to be. He liked it. We, you know, we we're like, okay. We we wrote the script out. Travis being busy, I think I would like to think that he's like, you two are very capable. I trust that you guys are going to make something good. Uh, and then with that, I gave you a script that was an outline. And knowing that he is a capable writer himself, he's going to take that outline and he's going to basically run with that. And then I'm going to go to the next script, uh, partially because he is. A, uh, he's a very big D&D &D fan, and he knows everything about D&D &D and this being a fantasy book. Uh, in issue two, when I got everything done, and I'm reading the dialogue that he changed, I had to look up words. I was like, I don't even know what this word is. And I did do a lot of, I felt like I did a lot of research on Dungeons and Dragons, like, you know, clerics and death knights, I know where they came, I got all that. But he's, you know, he, the, the dialogue that he was putting in it is dialogue that I never, I wouldn't have been able to do as authentic as he did. So we want to keep that going. So I wrote very little dialogue in issue three because I want him to keep doing what he's doing because it's bringing the characters out a lot more with the things that they're saying. And even some of the changes that you've made was adding more of that you know, fantasy dialogue to it. So, um, mm -hmm. And that's again, it's just giving trust and kind of like letting your ego go and being like, look, this isn't just about, it's not about me being a great writer and putting this out, it's about us all getting together and putting out the best story that we can put out. Uh, and it's a collective thing. It's never one doing something uh, better than the other. It's everybody getting together, like Travis said, taking your concept or your idea and making it better. Um, an artist taking your script and making changes to make it better. Also, that goes both ways too, where if I'm designing a character or working on a particular page, I'll pass things by you. And maybe you'll say, hey, can we change something about this character? Or can we change something about the artwork? And I have to also relinquish some of that as well. But that's not a problem. That's not an issue. That's a good thing that you know, we get to yeah. It's not just story ideas, but also art uh, designs and choices yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of felt that artists work a lot harder than we do. Um, <laughs> they like to think that too, don't they? No, they do. <laughs> but they do. They do. I, 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 when, when I would get something back from Chi on the damnation story, 
and if it wasn't exactly what I was just like, oh, well, that's not going to go in this story here, but I'm not going to ask him to spend days to redo this page. I'm just going to redo my story. Yes. So I'm going to I'm going to tweak it to my, and it actually it's <clears throat> always ends up working out better. Yeah. Well, that's funny you said that because we had uh, <clears throat> there's a scene in <clears throat> excuse me a scene in Ogres where Sean was like, I want to take this character out. Uh, I think you know there's a you know a, a, like a sacrifice scene. And I think we had like four people, and he's like, let's just make it three. But in the dialogue, I had all four of these people talking to each other. And then, like, look, and then I had to go back and change the dialogue. And actually, changing the dialogue made, it, like, made these characters, just for this brief page, it actually gave them better character. And taking that character out like, was the reason we were able to do that. So, yes, Sean made a decision to get rid of a character, to, you know, to be able to do more with what we had. And then in, instead of me being like, well, no, let's not do that, it was just like, we'll just change the dialogue a little bit and it fit. Yeah. So um, when, when you get this back and you've got the dialogue and it, it does fit with, with everything on the page from, from his fantastic art, did you ever find yourself going, we don't need this dialogue? Because I found that a lot when she would send stuff and I'm like, oh, it's, yeah, just I erase all, all that. I, don't I, also think that I also think that not enough writers and comics right now do a, a pass on their dialogue after the art is done, mm -hmm. where they sit with their script and the art, yes. and they line up and read panel to panel to mm -hmm. see how it lays out. Because uh, I often find, when we get to that step, I like find stuff that, like, ah, oh, that doesn't quite feel right anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, it's that's one last chance to kind of, like, really screw, tighten the screws and get this mm -hmm. down to as lean and mean as it needs to be, you know? Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. Um, so it's a it's a it's a really important step, and I think that a lot of uh, writers and comics they don't they don't really do it. It's become you know like the rise of Kickstarter, which is a good thing, but all of that is made kind of making a comic very like, making a story very transactional, you know, and like all right, here's my script, you're gonna draw it, I'm gonna do a Kickstarter to get this much of it and get it paid, and it'll be my thing, and here it is, and it's self it's become it's self published, and I did this, and that's great. But a lot of times you've never had anyone else come in and be like, it's not as great as it could be. Yeah. We can make this more great. We can make this a lot more great. And you know, so you get stuff that's I think you're getting a lot of stuff that's a lot more vanity project than mm -hmm. it needs to be. You know, and I think that like, you know, Ogre, the first one especially, is uh, I don't mean this in a bad way because I like Salvagers, but Salvagers, especially buying one, is way more that, that's basically the that's what right. you call a console, Bob. Well, that, I mean, that, no, I mean, it's not that it's bad. It's <laughs> definitely I had, and I, I, I admit, I had no, when I did salvage, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and for somebody not knowing what they were doing, it's not that bad. I don't, I didn't say it was bad. I said it's, uh, it is, it, it, it is, is, it is no, but it, it, it is one of those when you're reading it. And I, and I do, I still to this day, I look at it and I'm like, I wish I could go back in time and change it to make it better. Um, well, I mean, but, volume two is like, is a lot. Oh, yeah. Volume three is better still. Yeah, um, but you got to learn. But, you know, it's, the it's, first it's, four issues that you did were definitely a, a vanity project. Where you're like, I am brilliant. <laughs> Behold, how brilliant I am. You kind of wow. jumped into the deep end as well. But well, yeah. Starting with the twelve. With so the that's yeah. So the, the best advice that I give people, and I think any comic person gives somebody that knows anything, is uh, somebody says, "What's your you know what's your advice to me in getting into comics?" And it's like, do a one shot. Maybe a three-issue miniseries. Do not do a twelve-issue mega series. Uh, it's the, you're painting yourself in a corner. Um, I started that. I started writing it in 2001. The first issue I printed in 2013, and I still have two issues that I have to do, and it's been painstaking. Um, it's so yes, start small and then work your way up to a bigger one. I won't even listen to somebody who pitches me anything. <laughs> I mean, unless, you're, unless your name's like Warren Ellis or something, like, no. That's why the next one's only going to be nine. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so one of the things I, that, if you haven't read Ogre, it's, it's phenomenal. It's a, it's a great book. Um, and, and the D&D, and it really does shine through. That's, I'll say, oh, you like D&D? Here, buy this book. I was at the retail store. Um, so, um, but... The great thing about comics is it is this collaborative 
process. But there's a lot of comics that aren't. It's like here's here are the words, here are the pictures. You know, don't change anything. But with with ogres, o ogre, you really you see you can almost see that collaboration um, in that book, and I think that's what makes it so special. Yeah, and I think that's you know. It, We'd only planned on, I mean, I, when, we, when I worked with Sean, it was like going to be one book, and I never planned on anything more. And we were at Fan Expo Canada, and Sean was like, well, when are we going to do the next book? And I had already started to, the wheels turning on doing something else, and I was like, cancel everything. Like, Sean is willing to work with me again? Just stop everything. I'm, I'm going to do this. But that's Until he, because I was afraid he might change his mind. <laughs> I was just yeah. yeah. No, that's what happens when you work with a, a writer who gives you the freedom that you want to kind of just draw to your strengths. Like there are books that I've been pitched that I've turned down because it doesn't sound like fun to work on. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of drawing things like big cities and cars. I like more kind of supernatural stories or outdoorsy type stories, fantasy stuff. So, you know, I'm kind of selective about what I choose to work on. And, and like even just the pitch for the first over book, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is like right up my alley. This is, I just but, like the idea of you like reading the pitch and being like, ooh, so many cars. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You just like you write like cars in red ink with a question mark, you send it back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So it's far, that's a lot of, that's a lot of car, <laughs> cars. You know, it's not funny, have you drawn a car before? I would draw <laughs> shit, man. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. You like mustaches. Love mustache. Love mustache. Yeah, it's just they're fun to draw. Every every character's got a mustache. Yeah, or beard. Or beard. Yeah, just facial. Hair. It's just bad at drawing chins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to cover the mouths up so I don't have to draw. Them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, does anybody have any questions? Or with how collaborative you guys are, um, how far ahead do you allow yourself to go with scripts? Because I imagine you could probably write a lot faster than something could be penciled, inked, and colored. Well, so now, I mean, we're really kind of under the gun. So uh, um, basically now, I mean, like, I'm giving him an outline, and it's a page breakdown outline. Uh, we already know where we want to go, uh, although when we did make the changes last night, we talked about, because we knew we are like, all right, the, where we were going to go, but the changes that we made, we need to go somewhere else. And it was awesome because when talking about it, it was like, that's actually a much better ending than what we had. Um, so, you know, again, like go back to, uh, I have a page layout, um, a page breakdown outline that I'm handing off to Sean, knowing that he is talented enough that he's going to be able to take that and he's going to be able to, you know, run with it, where I would not be able to do that with most artists. But I, I think because that is how we work, Things change uh, very quickly, yeah. and we could start an issue with it maybe ending one way. Yeah. Midway through, it's changed. Yeah, it's and then we change something yeah. different, and then we have to figure out how we're approaching the next issue while we're working on issue two. Which is actually pretty awesome. It's awesome, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it really takes, I think, a strong relationship yes. between the writer and the It's not at all common. That's, no, yeah, that yeah. doesn't happen. You guys are making the queasy just talking. Well, you can trust that it's let getting better. In, let me put this in perspective. <laughs> They're talking about a four-issue series following up a really successful three-issue mini that came out at this time last year. The first issue of this has already been solicited, sales numbers are already in, and it goes to print already. Yeah. So that means number two is in the in previews right now as we speak. And these two assholes. No, are this, not the art's done. The art for two is done. This is not yet complete. Have you, have you read issue two? Yeah, it's awesome. It's it is awesome. Yeah. So issue two is done, and, and now we solicits have... three starts soliciting. Like, what today? What's the date? So now, so this is the inside of a publisher. Yeah, so, so three is soliciting probably. We've like already tomorrow. given the cover art. So three probably goes just live like, soliciting tomorrow. And the cover, the cover. And that means that number one comes out in a week. Number two comes out in five weeks. Number three comes out in nine weeks. And number four comes out in 12 weeks, 12 or 13 weeks. So what we're talking about is Sean's now drawing 44 to 48 pages. A day. <laughs> so this, this panel is, it's very nerve wracking from 
my perspective. We're gonna pull it off. Oh no, we're gonna kill yeah, it. Yeah, we're gonna kill it. Work and the story is even better. <laughs> I work way better under pressure than I do when I have all of this time. But. To be honest, he, he ends up like, going chasing bugs in his backyard. There are. He's got all the time <laughs> in the world, and he starts picturing them on Instagram. Oh, so and I'm like, why are you not at your art table? Well, if, I, if I wasn't in the comics, I would have been an entomologist. So don't make fun. I think that's great. Now, I, if it were, there are definitely projects where I would be losing my mind in craters that I would want to murder. Um, but these guys, I, that's probably going to be fine. So essentially, the way you guys are working, if you're working on issue three right now, because you might change the ending, you wouldn't start writing for issue four. Well, I am, so I, we already hashed out. He's got uh, issue three. He's going to start writing that. We talked last night. We talked about right. what we were going to do with the changes. So now I'm going to start outlining issue four with the changes that we made, and then it's and again like we he and I talk often like so we're always talking about what we're doing, the changes that he's making, and and it actually has and I think it's because with when we wrote Ogre when I wrote Ogre and you worked on it we had a lot of time, um, and when we did Ogres, I you know we were like let's hit it while the iron's hot so um, it all worked out and it's all gonna work. <laughs> the thing is, the changes that we're making aren't massive. Yeah, they're not massive. They're not changing like everything. It's just little changes that are, instead of this guy doing this, he's doing something else which actually is better for the story. Yeah, so. as, as far as the entire the story, uh, we have that done. It's just minor plot changes yeah. that, that are happening. <laughs> not common. Don't worry. Not common. Not Don't common. do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's yeah. happening here as a follow-up to a series that was already very successful. So these guys, have er they've earned the right, basically, to kind of do this loosey-goosey <laughs> thing. <laughs> it's weird. Go ahead. Yeah, but, so, so obviously you guys are all in tune with fantasy and dungeons and all of that, right? That's part of the strength of your relationship, right? Yeah. Now, how did that cross over to your editing? Because he's not really, he's got multiple things he edits, I'm assuming, right? And yeah, not all of them are fantasy, right? So yeah, you have to yeah. you have to code switch yeah. your stuff yeah. from how you're critiquing, yeah. how you're helping. Right, so I, what I would say work. is that um, no matter what genre you're working in, uh, you know, the, the rules of story structure don't really change. Like the things that make characters important, the things that make people care about characters don't change. The, the things that will um, you know make people make characters speak to human beings and all that I don't I don't think are different from science fiction because we, we publish a lot of science fiction a lot of horror um, and I think that there's elements that are the same across the board um, I would also without without like sounding too arrogant I would describe myself as excessively well read so I can pretty much like converse across like literary languages from like classical literature to horror or to fantasy to science fiction just like you know across the across the board so like you're probably not going to find like um you know some like genre that i don't have any familiarity with the tropes of that genre and not be able to speak that language like you might be able to speak it better than me but i'm i'm probably going to know you know where you're headed. I mean, I've even written like cozy mysteries, right? Under like a pen. About something, so like, uh, about something that's like a cultural, you know, shift like a wire. You know, we in Baltimore. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so what about something like that, where you're coming from the point of view of projects, you know, and then you're going to do a mystery story or a fantasy story? But but it's coming from that it's coming yeah, from that world. Yeah, I mean, I would find something like that really interesting. Um, I mean, to me, again, it would come down to like, uh, you know, I'm a upper. I grew up as an upper middle class white person, right? So that's, you know, I don't know how many interesting stories you can tell about that guy, but probably not very many. <clears throat> but you know, that's my background. So I I can't with any kind of. Um, uh, authenticity, talk about about like what it's like to grow up in the projects or, or anything like that. But I, I still think that there are elements of storytelling that are, you know, the same elements of storytelling. Like I, I think a good example is if, if you're watching the um, the Wu Tang story mm -hmm. on Hulu, mm -hmm. right? 
like that's a, a very African American low income product story, but you know this is still a story about human beings and their emotions and what they're doing and how to create something and all that. And those themes I think are universal. And you know I I, I would still think that you know I wouldn't like come to your project and start telling you how to write black if that's what you're asking. Because <laughs> I don't know. You, you, you show it to me, but if, if I, like, I, I would be able to tell if your character is resonating or not. The industry went through that shift, right? You know, I've been reading comic books since 69, like 68. Sure. And I've seen every black character come up with the word black in front of their name, right? Oh, yeah. And then it shifted, right? Yeah. It shifted. And so then, as you say, though, in order to have a good story, you know, you gotta have some Odyssey stuff in it, right? And you plot out the points and all of that, just like everybody else, right? Yeah, I, I think that I think that some of the stuff that you're talking about that has been like, oh, it's a black character with black in front of its name. I I think lacked a little bit of authenticity. Some yeah. sometimes, not in every case, but sometimes. Um, you know, I I think that you could probably even with I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but you know, even with stuff right now, mm -hmm. you know, if you know, you're trying to kind of take advantage of the stuff that's popular right now, right? You're, you're trying to like virtue signal or whatever word you want to use to be this. If the story isn't authentic, it's not going to speak to people and they're not going to respond to it. And if it is, they will, right? Um, and, I, and I think that the things that make people respond to stuff is fairly universal in terms of story structure. So you could definitely do, I mean, I, I think that, did you watch Bright? Yeah, which was on Netflix. Yeah, I, did. Um, I thought that Bright was like almost there. It was almost. It was yeah. almost there. It was like really close. Yeah, yeah. It was really close to being that thing that tied fantasy with urban, urban culture and made it happen. But it didn't quite get there because I, at some point they decided to like go, in my opinion, go way too safe with the whole thing. Okay. You know, they decided like, okay, we're gonna, you know, we don't wanna be too, go too far with this. We don't wanna let this happen. I, right, exactly. I, I, you know, if it were me, I would've said like, yeah, you should really push the envelope with this and try to make, you know, like I would say like, you, you, you take straight out of Compton and add a fantasy element to it, yeah. then you got something. Yeah. You know, like it's a, it's a, street hip hop group of elves or something, <laughs> you, know? I, you know, I don't know, but I think that that is, I think that like Bright was very close to what people want, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think it quite got there, but it's close. Um, and I think that's because a lot of the story elements are common to all of us, mm -hmm. you know, we, all of us have these things that we can relate to, which is why I think you get movies like Straight Outta Compton, which were huge mm -hmm. across the board, not just to black men of a certain age who remember NWA, right? I have a question. Do you guys grow up in the same area? I'm trying to figure out how to get this relationship. Uh, no, I actually grew up in Philadelphia. He's from Canada. We just, uh, we met at a convention and we were talking and we, I liked his art and he was like, yeah, let's work together on something. So I was like, I started racking my brain. I'm like, what can I work on? Yeah. The yeah. Sean Daly. Super nice Canadian Toronto, and then awful me. Philly scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It sounds like a bunch of projects you guys talked about, like the 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 uh, we haven't yet. I mean, Not yet. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, um, again, like when it came to doing Ogres, um, I, I hadn't even thought about doing another book until he said he wanted to do another book. And the challenge, one of the challenges I've had with Salvagers uh, on an economic scale is that you have a volume one and you have a volume two. And when you're at conventions or whatever, like even if you're a publisher and you're like, we printed 3,000 number ones and we printed 3,000 number twos, you end up finding out that you're like, wow, I have a lot more volume twos. Uh, and when I would be at conventions, I would sell out of volume one, and then I would always have a hard time selling volume two because I would sell it as a volume two, even though there was like a little scroll and like a little synopsis of what happened in volume one. So that aside, I was like, I do not want to do a sequel. Um, I don't want to get into a position where 
now I have all this volume two and people are like, well, I don't want volume two, I need to read volume one first. So um, Travis and I spoke and I was like, I told him, I was like, I don't want to do a sequel, he agreed. So I tried to figure out a story that I could do where it could run parallel. And, um, and that's where that kind of came, like, so Ogres really kind of came out of like nothing. Uh, and it wasn't like, um, you know, where Ogre left off and it was like, we're gonna start there. Um, I, you know, just had to come up with an idea, a concept well, to do. Also, like, the, it, the, the story, the three issue miniseries, just is bookended so well. Yeah. That it almost, it just would like, you can revisit the world, but yeah. I think to try to like, shoehorn an unplanned sequel into that would have just... Yeah, it would have been, yeah. It ended, yeah, Ogre really it just ended, ended on a It good, ended yeah. perfectly and just let it be. Yeah. And then you want to revisit that world, do another thing. Yeah. Right? Like, so, um, so, so Alien, Aliens. Is yeah, movie. exactly. So that's where that Two kind separate of movies, you know? came out. Like, uh, so Ogre's, you know, um, kind of, like, I mean, like, between you and I, and then, of course, when we brought, we came up with the idea, we talked to Sean, and it was like, we all agreed on it. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, that pretty much was yeah. a collective... At first, I wanted to do a sequel. To, you did? I did. I really did. And then, uh, when you had mentioned uh, through Bob that the idea of starting just a brand new story in the same world with brand new characters, I was like, oh yeah, that's why you trust your editor. And yeah. now looking at it, it's like, yep, that was 100% the right idea to go with. Yeah. And Sean I, just I said to me, like from yeah. the beginning, the sequel would have been yeah. just, it's like, it just ends. It ends so if, if you haven't read Ogre, stop by the table, pick up Ogre, uh, not just because it's our book, but. It's a, it's, I, I'm so super proud of it. It's, uh, it's one of those things where you write something and you're like, you see something else that somebody r r has written and you look at it and you're like, ah, oh, I wish I would have written that. And Ogre is one of the things that I'm like so proud that I wrote and that I can put my name on. And, that, and I'm proud to have worked with Travis on it and Sean with it. And collectively, um, I love these guys because of what we went through creating it. And it really did. It has a beautiful beginning and a, it ends so well. Um, so yeah, agreed. Like we didn't want to mess that up with doing anything uh, more with it, but doing something with new characters in that same universe. Um, and then, yeah, it worked out. And it's gonna work out. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Any other questions? Yeah, was there um, any type of character design you did first, or did you just dive into the story? Did you no, world sure, build yeah, with a Bible, or what? Well, yeah. uh, once we decided the characters that we wanted in the story, and we kind of fleshed them out a little bit, Bob would send me like the descriptions of everything, and then that would be the first stage of the process, is figuring out how they look, uh, how the way Bob wrote them is going to appear physically, you know, through, through them, and yeah, like uh, we wouldn't have been able to you know, go much further if we didn't know who these characters were and what they look like, because uh, that's a really big part of who they are. Yeah. And then in Ogres, we have a lot more characters. Um, and again, like that comfort level that you get with uh, the art artist-writer relationship, we did that a little less. We did the main characters, we, you know, did concept art on, but, um, you know, there's the, the beast that they ride on is something from your child yeah, like dog. Everything, everything, everything that uh, I try Actually, to we have a character that looks a lot like Travis yeah. and a dwarf. Pure coincidence. <laughs> Pure, purely, <laughs> purely coincidental. But yeah, so it's really at this point, like, you know, when we had some of these fantasy characters that are being sacrificed, and I, in the script, I just wrote three fantasy characters. And he knows, like, all right, I have. The liberty to do whatever I want here, and uh, and oftentimes when you have that artist re uh, creator relationship or artist writer relationship, it's like if I give you any description and you follow that description, it's probably not going to be as good as what you would have come up with on your own. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's where we are at this point. It's kind of like I have I'm I give him all the leeway because I know that he's going to come up with something better than I could imagine in my head because he is uh, so big into D&D &D and he knows all that kind of stuff. And he does things and then he'll post it on Twitter and he'll be like, there's no coincidence that this guy's uh, you know, outfit looks like this person. And I'm like, Google, I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> well, um, I have to draw a lot of uh, influence from the things that I love, right? Like all of my hobbies and my interests all end up somehow making it into the artwork that I'm drawing. Uh, because you have to draw your influence from somewhere, and why not the things that you love? Uh, like, 
Bob just said, one of the, the mounts in the story is based off of my family dog, an old English bulldog. So I just took that, yeah, little Eddie, I took him and uh, <laughs> I just made it like a mutated version of him. And it was a blast to draw. But yeah, you gotta draw that stuff in from real life. Yeah. How long is this supposed to go? <laughs> I think Travis wants to go. No, I'm just wondering uh, it's 3.30 now. Okay. I just wanted to, to, to kind of to go off of something you said earlier when you're asking about, you know, what if you don't know as an editor about something. Sometimes it's actually really good if you don't know about that, you know, about because then you can say, if the story doesn't make sense to you, right. it's not going to make sense to somebody else. So, again, sometimes you get too close to what you're doing and you forget to put it, oh yeah, I do have to tell them that. You know, they're not in my brain because you don't want to be in there. Um, and that is all about asking questions. Yeah, so it's it's kind of good. If, if, if you get it, then you've done your job. But if I'm a little confused here and here and here, mm -hmm. and it's kind of good sometimes to not know that because then you know it, they know, and, and you both might not be able to, to see that. that whole well, like, uh, I think a really good example is, is Damnation of Charlie Wormwood, uh, which is a, a new book just came out written by Christy. It's about um, a guy who uh, teaches classes in a maximum security prison. And it, it has a real Breaking Bad vibe. Now, I've neither been in or taught classes in a maximum security prison. Um, and so there's, I, I would imagine a lot of, but she has, right? I have. So it's, there's a lot of inside baseball throughout this whole thing, you know, but it all makes sense because it's paced out in a way and tied to things that you do understand, you know? It is fun though, one of my friends, she teaches criminal justice and she uses it because you can't take pictures in prison. So we had what you call, this is the stupidest idea ever. So it's the chit board and you have it, you're assigned a number and you walk in and you just flip the number over and that's how they know you're, you're in there. That's it. And half the time I forget my number because they're different at every prison. So I would just go, eh, I'll be 13 today. And then I realized, they don't know I'm in here, <laughs> which is actually used in the book. But it was just one of those things. But nobody has it. It's, it's the most boring thing in the world. So nobody had a picture of it. So I had to, it's like my artist, I, I apologize for this Chi, but this is what it looks like. And they, you know, draw it, make it nice. But she uses that because there's no other example of it. So this is it. This is that process. That's also kind of cool. That was actually really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, when you're writing things, the most important thing is to know where you're beginning and where you're ending, and then in the middle where you're going to turn. Um, I personally, as a writer, that's what I like to do because it's, you know, if you can have a beginning and an ending, like you know where you're starting and you know eventually where you want to end up, and then if you know where you want to turn the story, then you can start kind of working in different directions. Um, Sometimes I feel like as a writer, if I start feeling like I'm about to hit a writer's block, um, I'll, I'll jump off of that scene and I'll go, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to come over here because I have an idea for this. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's even going to stay. Um, but m for me, writing, even like when I was in college, uh, I would really get into blocks where it was like I had to write it perfect the first time. Uh, and then my professor was always like, just dump it out. Like anything that you have, just write, write five pages. And if you get one paragraph out of those five pages, then that's great. So uh, often how I write now is just dumping all my ideas out. And again, if I feel like in the, somewhere in the beginning, I can't get to the middle and I know where I want to do somewhere near the end, I'll just start dumping ideas in the middle, or I mean at the end. And then eventually you just have a bunch of garbage from beginning to end and then you, <laughs> hope to be like, okay, now I can sit down and I have everything from beginning, middle to end, and now I can start shaping it. I can start cutting things out. I can start um, you know, figuring out what works and what doesn't work, and maybe even saying like, you know what, this might work better here in the beginning, or... Um, you it know, also so, cuts the work up, right? So yes. from a project management point of view, you know, because in, in my heart I'm a project manager, right? I want stuff to get done, and I want it to be done on time. And so the easiest way to do that is, you, you know, draw a Gantt chart, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever. Like, right. These are the milestones. Same thing with the story. These are the milestones. This is what you're trying to get to. Make the 
the work chunk small, right? You're not going to sit down and be like, all right, I got to write the novel, you know, I'm going to start writing it. Page one, Bob stood naked on the edge of a cliff, which is the first line from Fountainhead. I haven't read Fountainhead, nor should you. Have fun with that one. Uh, you know, um, but it, it makes, like, you know, these are like bite-sized little bites. Like, hey, you know what the beginning is, we talked about it. Why don't you write two or three scenes that could be the first scene? Yeah. You know, and then we can shape it more as you go, right? So I'm, I'm very big on like planning and outlining and then, you know, start doing the work in bite sized pieces and then eventually you have, op I'm real big on options too. Like you have a lot of different ways you can go and, you know, so you've created a bunch of stuff. And if we're lucky, maybe some of it isn't awful. I mean, do Hmm? Like a little bit agile methodology, you might look at Agile management? Yeah, I'm on computer software program. Hmm. I'm not familiar with agile. I mean, crazy, I'm crazy world. Yeah. I'm I'm uh you know I have some of the older stuff like I'm Six Sigma certified. Yeah, yeah, you know I have all that. You know because I had a I had a whole corporate life. You know like yeah, I have related. all that stuff. It's related to it. It's yeah. Yeah. You know it's lean. I you know I know all about lean methodologies. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. So I said Gantt chart, and you're like, ooh. <laughs> ooh, a Gantt chart. Yeah, I was like, wow, how'd you get that into a comic? I was like, well, it's not really a Gantt chart, but kind of. They have a thing called Kanban, too, which is what you do with sticky notes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh -huh. Yeah, sticky notes are a part, big part of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we use a lot of stuff. I, I own a, a game company, too, called Deepwater oh, right. Games. Right? Right. So we do a lot of tabletop yeah. gaming. Yeah. So you have these projects that will go for a year. And we use a lot of like those same organizational tools to like try to hit milestones as you're doing game design, play testing, and get this thing out. Because at the same time you have all that, you have this massive design project. Like, what's the box look like? How do you manufacture it? What's it look like inside the box? What's the table feel? You know, all this different stuff you have to think about. You have this whole team of people all doing different stuff. So you end up with this, you know, enormous thing. It's crazy. But I actually came from, uh, you know, I was a research scientist with Dow Chemical. So okay. all this stuff is like yeah, awesome. kindergarten, yeah. basically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. Just, I'm just, kidding. It's dumb. really good. You're it's a really man good. amongst <laughs> boys. <laughs> Me? Well, you kind of write it at, has to write, you know, at like 8 a.m. in the morning. Well, no, I mean. <laughs> you get inspired. Yeah, a lot of things are different, though. Uh, <laughs> no, I am, um, right now, currently, um, I am writing at night. Uh, but uh, one of the things that um, Sean and I were talking about is uh, if, if I don't have more than two hours to write, I don't bother writing at all. Okay. Um, for me, it just doesn't, I can't sit down and write for one hour. Uh, it'll frustrate me, I will, because uh, if I have two hours or more, I feel like I am hitting a flow. I can, um, if I have multiple projects going on, I will pick up one project and I will go over and I'll start editing dialogue or checking dialogue just to start getting the wheels turning and then I want to jump in and I really want at least two hours, if not more. Uh, one of the issues I had when I was trying to fit in writing, if I only had an hour, uh, I would feel like I didn't, I didn't get to where I wanted to get to. I didn't, um, you know, whatever goal that I had, I couldn't accomplish. And then as a writer, like it would frustrate me and, and then I'd be in my head for another 24 hours until I could sit down and write again. So I felt for me, it was better to be like, if I can't do it, then I'm not gonna try to do it. And I'm gonna map out time where I know I can sit down, I'm not distracted and I can take the time to get where I wanna get to. Uh, and, and as a writer, I mean, I don't know, um, I've really talked to other writers about this, but when you sit down and you say to yourself, like, I want to get, I want to get is my issue four outline done from beginning to end. If for any reason I don't do that, if I get to a point where I'm like, I only got halfway done, I feel like I, I, I can't, I'm unsettled. I feel like I haven't finished what I set out to do, where even if I do, if I'm like, I'm dumping it all out and I do have a beginning and an ending, even if I know, like, it's not the best, then I, at least I feel like I've accomplished that. And now I can pick another day to go back and refine it and to edit it and to change it. Um, but yeah, if uh, I need to have that time, so I do try to map out time. I know what my life schedule is. So, um, you know, usually like on a Tuesday or Wednesday when I get home from work, 
Uh, I'm working from you know eight o'clock until 11, 12 o'clock at night. You married? You married? Oh me. <laughs> um, we're <coughs> separated, oh. so that's uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, I'm going to ask. You know, significant other. Yeah. Help you with that setting aside that time. Yeah. I hit the wall when the kids came. Well, that's, you know, not, that's the thing, like having kids, uh, and I would be trying to, I'd have things that I needed to write, and you put the kids to bed, you start writing, the kids wake up, they're crying, and then you're, uh, and then you get frustrated, and I realize, I'm like, I'm not being the best dad that I can be to these kids, so um, when I am with the kids, take them like, to the orphanage, <laughs> give someone else a shot. Can you just hold on to these kids for the next five years? Uh, I'm trying to get this no, it's like, you know, when I, uh, when I go home, when I have the kids for the weekend, um, I don't bring my computer with me, like, I don't even attempt to try to write because I don't want to put myself in a place where, you know, I'm feeling negative about this writing thing, so I just, I X the writing out altogether. Um, you know, I might bring a notebook with me just to jot down ideas that I might have, but uh, I, I don't do the writing when I'm with the kids, but then on the weekends where I don't have the kids, if I'm not at convention, um, then I'm just... You know, like I do that too. <laughs> I neglect my children. He does. Traditional American father. Yeah. But he also, he has a superwoman drawing, wife. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, my drawing schedule is really kind of, it's all over the place. Like it changes day to day. It's, you know, uh, well to give you like a specific idea of how a day would go. I like sleeping, so I like to sleep in. Uh, I'll, I'm sleeping usually in cereal. Yeah, sorry. Sleeping, cereal, bugs, yeah. drawing. That's it. That's my life. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. I, I usually start drawing at like 10 in the morning uh, until around 3 or 4, and then I'll take a break, go look run at errands, bugs. look at bugs and stuff like that, you know, hang out with friends. This picture of like moving around on the deck. This is like when he says hang out with friends, it says bugs. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> And then it's usually an entomologist. Yeah, what's wrong with that? No, it's, no, it's much better than drawing comic books. I usually start drawing again at around uh, 7 or 8, and then I'm wrapping up at like uh, 1 or 2 in the morning. Well, because it gets to sleep till 10. Exactly. <laughs> right. so, it gets to sleep till 10. That is a musician. Well, I, I worked at a recording studio for five years before doing comics, so there you go. So, uh, Christy, you, you did the donation at Charlie One Word. Uh, you've done your own projects. How is it, as co-writers now, or co-creators, how is that different from the uh, writer-artist relationship? Uh, so we actually haven't started. I mean, well, I guess we could say we started. We, um, we kind of started. Yeah, so uh, the book that we're writing is uh, it's a diesel punk story. And the reason I wanted to work with uh, Christy on it was, one, because I love the damnation of Charlie Woodward. And the other one was uh, I'm working on a project where Travis convinced me, he was like, you know, if you're going to do this with predominantly female cast of characters, that you want to, you, you know, you want to go out and find a woman to uh, co-write it with you so you can really bring out the authenticity of these characters. Now, that's a different project than what Christy and I are working on. But doing, having that conversation with Travis, it made me realize that I need to do that same thing with this other uh, volume of a story that I'm working on. And the fact that Christy works with Source Point Press was, and that she's a brilliant writer, I was like, it kind of kills two birds with one stone that I can have her with Source Point Press and has a book with Source Point Press and do another book with Source Point Press. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm kind of laying out the outline for her and saying like, this is where we are and this is where I want it to go, but then also giving her the freedom to be like, you know, do what you want with these characters, because these characters, the main characters are new, and we can do whatever we want with them. Uh, the characters that are going throughout the story are more the B side, the B story of it. Uh, and already talking with her Friday night, she had all these different experiences that she's gone through that just amazingly add to these characters that we Bizarrely, are, you can't really relate to. <laughs> well, no, no, it's, uh, it was more of the, the farming, uh, you know, it was um, this woman, it was, she inherited the, a land from her parents and all the different struggles that she had to go through it. So it was weird that I'm like, I, we didn't even talk about that. That had nothing to do with her working on it, but she had that, ex she knew that experience of it. So, um, so basically, and it's, again, it's like having trust when you're co-writing with somebody. Um, 
you know that there's no ego in there. You know that it's not going to be something where she's going to bring ideas to me and I'm going to be like, no, I don't, you know, it's, it's going to be, I trust that it's going to be a really collaborative thing where we both uh, respect each other and I'm going to, what she's bringing to the table, I'm going to really enjoy and let her, you know, go with it. Um, and then the little things that need to be in there, uh, you know, to make this story keep going from, you know, from one to three um, will be like, okay, well, we need to add this in here. We need to bring this character in here. So it'll be more of like the characters that I'm bringing in there and then the character interacting with the characters that she's developing in the story, which it's going to be awesome. I'm just playing Borderlands 3. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Research. Um, no. Well, no, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, you know, my, I'm trying to kind of encourage Bob and sort of groom him into more of a managing a project role and being more of an editorial creator, um, you know, as opposed to like, oh, I'm scripting this. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to like encourage him to be like, you know, you could kind of, you know, maybe it's, you know, you've been doing this a while, you've got a bunch of issues under your belt, you've had some success, you know, you, you profess that you want to be more involved in more projects. Well, a good way to do that is to, you know, build teams and sort of start managing your teams. Uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, I don't want to say merely writing scripts because writing scripts is really important and a ton of work, but <clears throat> as opposed to only focusing on that, you know, like focus on, you know, because for me, I started off writing and then I realized like, oh, I'm <coughs> mediocre at best, but I'm really good at project management and helping get something across the finish line. You know, I think Bob could do that too. So basically, yeah, Travis just true. said, I'm a terrible writer. <laughs> that's fair, thank you. He said mediocre. Mediocre, I said I was, I said I was I mediocre. Know. I know. I strive to be mediocre. I'm still working. I yeah. love you. Yeah, you'll be in the middle of the there soon. No, I think it's gonna be really exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to you know, bounce ideas and it's, 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 it's a lot more fun than just sitting in a room by yourself, just going, yeah. Sure. Well, that sounds good. You know, having a staff meeting, you know, with the voices in your head. So it's it's nice to you know you know have have Bob and I'll just we'll think of something and we'll just send a message yeah. and then it turns into you know this whole whole different animal and it's it's I think it's going to be really really fun. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Good. I'm so yeah. glad to hear that. Well, keep following us, Source Point Press, if you will. Um, you know, I, I got cards here. We uh, we have an online store. We're also diamond uh, distributed, which means you can go into any comic shop uh, near you, and you can see what we are distributing. Like, we're soliciting each month. And please um, do that. Go in and say, hey, I'd like these Source Point Press books because sometimes the back of the previous book gets overlooked a little bit. So you know, make sure you say, hey. Search me press, this, this new company, they're, they're, they're awesome. Yeah. And if you go to our website, the first thing that'll pop up will ask you if you want to be a part of our newsletter. Um, I run the newsletter. Uh, it's not anything that's really in your face. It's basically, you get two emails a month. Uh, in the beginning of the month, it's telling you what we're soliciting for the month. And then around the 15th, I send another one out just to remind you, this is what we have going on if you haven't gone out and gotten it yet. But we also add the news of like where we're going to be. Uh, we do 70 conventions a year. So you'll see, you know, in the next three months where we're going to be. Uh, we have a book of the month because we also do prose. So we have a book of the month that links you right to our website where you can buy it. Uh, and any other big news, uh, we have a, we were in free comic book day. We have another one that's going to be in Halloween Comic Fest. So you're, if you join that newsletter, you know, again, you're, you're going to get an email once, twice a month, kind of giving you the state of affairs with Source Point Press, where we are. Uh, we sometimes do creator spotlights. Uh, so the best thing to do is like get you, you can't always meet us at a convention. So if you are in there, you kind of get a little Q and A with some of our creators, get to know us a little bit better, and um, yeah, it uh, helps us uh, uh, as well to um, you know where you're getting to know what we're putting out there. And if you go to your comic shops and order it, you're not only ordering something for yourself, but you're raising uh, awareness to the comic shop of who we are. And then when they get it, hopefully they read through it. And then they say, you know what, I know a couple other people that actually like this, I'll get that for them. And then hopefully they have their own source point press section. Like, oh yeah, come on.